Hello and welcome to another edition of the Master of Business podcast. Today I'm joined by Jane Rogers, Associate Professor, Enterprise and Knowledge Exchange here at Teesside University International Business School and Emily Conyard, Lecturer in Digital Marketing. In today's episode we're going to talk things digital marketing, we're going to talk about the latest trends and a bit of future gazing as well and also talk a little bit about the MSc Digital Marketing here at Teesside University International Business School. So, Jane, thank you for being a guest. Please tell us a little bit about you, because you have all things digital marketing in the bag, haven't you? An extensive career in that space. Uh, yeah, so I've been studying digital forever, since, it, you know, since we first heard of digital. So I did my PhD in how activists were using the internet, just as the internet was kind of first emerging. So I finished that in 2000. So I've always been interested in that space around how technology affects the way we communicate. So my background is actually in political communication, right. but I was using that in an international context and developing this kind of expertise and knowledge in how we were using this new transnational technology for transnational interactions. And of course, over time, through various stages of my career, that shifted to the point where I left academia for a while and ended up working on the Google Digital Garage project right. because that, that was kind of my shift into digital marketing because that took me from this, what is messaging and how do we deliver it, to how do we really use these technologies? And that really brought consumers into the picture as well. So, and then I came back into academia, bringing all of that stuff together to be teaching digital marketing. Amazing and fascinating story. So it must be fascinating working on the Google Garage project. Yeah, it's a really interesting project to work on because what Google were looking at was that they had all of these tools, most of which were free and available to people that people didn't really know how to use. So the Google Digital Garage project was, we had pop-up spaces for periods of a few months, but then we also had um, these outreach projects where we were going out and doing talks to, that businesses could come to, and just teaching them how to use all these different aspects of digital marketing. So there were things like, how do you understand your audience? How do you know who you are delivering your product to? How do you know um, how to set up your website effectively? How do you know how to use social media and so on? And the Digital Garage project was giving people like sort of basic advice on how to do that, which in turn they were then implementing and then lots of people would come back to the garage ready for their next stages moving forward with their digital marketing journey. And then so you brought that back into academia and of course uh, our students here at Teesside University International Business School benefit from your wisdom and, and practice. I hope so. I hope so. I know they do. <laughs> they do. Brilliant. Thanks Jane. Emily, welcome to the episode. So you've also got a, a fascinating digital marketing background as well. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so follow, following yours is uh, quite uh, nerve-wracking, but um, so I suppose mine's a bit more, um, I've worked in it professionally um, as well. So I um, did, came to Teesside, I did my undergrad in multimedia journalism, was very, very 110% sure I was going to be the next rock journalist. I wanted <laughs> to go on to uh, with all the major rock bands and write all the exposés and stuff. Still love it, it is still my passion, but um, I didn't realise that I was getting a really great skill set for marketing. So shooting and editing video and audio, um, like we're doing today. Um, so when I finished, I, I, I sort of did a load of work experience. I did a summer internship while I was here um, in digital marketing with um, a fashion brand called Ice Unky Battleship. And then I went to work with the creative alchemist with Lisa Holt for a bit. And she basically, she was a fantastic mentor, taught me everything I know for, about digital marketing. But then when I finished, I went to work for Visual Soft, worked in email marketing. Uh, because I'm a great believer that whatever job I take, I'm always going to do something I've never done before. And that's the amazing thing with digital is that there is so much stuff out there that is constantly being created and constantly being innovated. So it is an ever changing space. You're never fully at the forefront of it, I believe. Um, 
So after Visual Soft, I went to work for the Chamber of Commerce for a bit and then thought, you know what, I love Juni and I want to go back and do my master's. So I went back, did a master's and then decided afterwards to go into the public sector. So I worked for the Ministry of Justice for a year, which was fantastic. It was really great to be part of a, to be a civil servant and to do marketing in a really, really different environment. And then following, before coming here, I went to the NHS and I worked for a, a hospital trust um, during the back end of COVID. So that was really, really interesting to be in a marketing space uh, during that time. Difficult, but so, so rewarding. Um, I loved every minute of it. Brilliant. Well, we're glad to have you here in the business school as well, part of our ever-growing team of academic staff, particularly in the marketing space. So, Emily, you alluded to there that, you know, it's difficult to keep up with all things digital. Digital marketing is, is constantly evolving, isn't it? Marketing as a discipline always evolves, doesn't it? But I think the advent of digital communications and the technology is really, really forcing us uh, as marketers to keep up with our own professional practice, but also to you know stay ahead of the curve. And because if we're in a position where we're supposed to be advising businesses what to do, we've got the sort of future gaze to a certain extent, I guess. So a question to you both really, and I'm happy for you to chat between yourselves on it. Digital marketing, what's hot at the moment in that space? What's not hot in the days? As Emily says, it just changes all the time. So it's this constant dynamic and fluid kind of space going on. So I don't know. I mean, I guess one big thing is AI. Yeah. And we've known that AI was coming. We've had conversations about it. You know, we can look back over the past maybe 20 years and go, AI is coming, AI is coming. But we didn't really believe it. We've seen it in movies and we've kind of, we've got a sort of vague idea. But I think we didn't really believe that machines would really be able to start doing the things that humans do in the way that we are now seeing them do. So I think um, AI is really important in terms of how we're going to understand how things are going to be marketed. But the sort of the whole job roles are within digital marketing as well. I think that's going to change. So that, that's one big area. I do have another one, but I'll come to Emily. Do you want to say anything about AI? Yeah, so um, I think it's really interesting that it's been integrated into platforms now mm. for content posting. So I know LinkedIn is uh, working with it. So you, you can essentially get somebody to write the posts for you. I don't think it's something we should fight against. I think it's something we should work with because mm. um, it is that thing with marketers and I see it all the time and it, we are meant to be a one man band. We're meant to have a, a skill set that is so diverse and so large and a lot of it is admin based. A lot of it is a lot of scheduling, a lot of behind the scenes. So perhaps AI can take some of that alleviation out of that admin and let, allow us to be a bit more creative in our roles. Give us that breathing space that we so desperately need in digital just to think and brainstorm. That's really interesting. Can I, if I'm coming if I may, so AI, I agree, I, I think we've got to stop trying to fight it it's not going to go away uh, and I do think it can help do you think though that it is misses the creative element AI do you, uh, do you think you still need the the human sort of aspect of it to come up with the ideas the creativity that's going to get the hook and AI maybe puts it together. What are your thoughts on that? I, th I, I do, but uh, I'm a great believer that um, people buy from people, um, word, like word of mouth. Um, we're very complex human beings, aren't we, with, mentally and emotionally? And that's what marketing taps into. And I think as well, like, they do draw from a range of sources. It is, it's very, it's actually it, well, it's scary, let's be honest, the amount of stuff that it know, that we, we have in digital and, and the amount of stuff it knows and it can create. But I do genuinely believe that creativity has a deg certain degree of innovation and collaboration and working together. And some of the best campaigns that I've ever worked on myself personally have been the ones where we've been literally in a, in a team, in a room with post-it notes and we crack it. And that moment when you crack something and you come up with something that's truly creative for a brand, you can't beat that feeling. It's it's almost euphoric. Um, so AI, it, it is great. And I do think we should lend ourselves to it because if we don't, we're just going to fall behind. But I do believe there is a space for us um, as human beings in marketing. I would say, yes, yeah, certainly that's the case. But if we look at the history at the moment, we need humans to do the creative stuff. We, we don't know where that's going to go. So if we look at the history of digital marketing, if we look across, say, we didn't even have smartphones 20 years ago, no. you know, and now every single person who, who has, is able to have a smartphone has a smartphone, spends half their life glued to them. You know, so the changes in digital have been so rapid 
that we just don't know. It could be that in two years, in five years, in 10 years time, AI can do all the creative stuff too. But we can move with that too. Yes. We've, we've incorporated these things, these changes in technology as we go along and we've learned to behave differently. You know, we've learned to spend a lot of our time on screens, but use that usefully in a meaningful kind of way. And I think we can do the same with this. It's as you said, we don't need to fight the technology. We can go with it, but we, and we add the human into it to make sure that it's evolving in a way that works for humans. But that might change over time. You know, it might be that the creative stuff can come from AI and we add something else or we do something different. The more we try to resist it, the more, the more tense we become about technology and the more, challenge, the more of a challenge it faces for us, I think. So the, the, the old principles of marketing, so having a good, solid strategic marketing plan, that's my background, I'm a strategic marketer. I think, and you may challenge me on this, the technology is evolving and we have to keep up with it, but those basic principles of strategic marketing have never shifted really. And you can have all the great tech in the world, but if you don't have an idea of who your audience is, what, what they want, developing a value proposition. You can have all the digital tools in the world, put all the posts out on all the channels, but it won't work. Would you agree that we still need to be mindful of a good marketing strategy? In fact, is it more important than ever before now that we have a really, really strong strategic marketing plan to be able to execute effectively with digital marketing? I think so, because with digital and with digital marketing, the world effectively is your potential audience. You know, that's, they're your potential consumers. And so you need to be able to break that down effectively. So when I'm talking about technology as something that we need to flow with, it's changing, you know, yeah, we do need to do that, but it's not, that's not to say just rely on the technology to do everything for us. No, that we certainly need to be able to understand who your audience are, what they're doing online, how you reach them, what's the right messaging for them, what are the best ways, what's the type of content that they're, inter they're interested in, all of those things. And we can learn a lot of those things from the technology that we have, from the data yeah. it's gathering. So we can use the technology in that way, but then using you know, the human planning skills to go, right, right, I've gathered all this data, I understand what I'm doing with it, and make your plans accordingly. Yeah, I would totally agree. Um, I used to say when I worked with clients and I'd say to them, who's your target audience? And they'd go, everybody. Mm -hmm. And I'd be like, well, that's the equivalent of shouting into an empty room um, mm -hmm. with marketing. Um, it, it's, a, it's great to have all these digital spaces and um, every platform has its own USP. Every platform has its own sort of niche in terms of the content that you should post. But you should definitely know your audience, your mission statement, your values as a business and your objectives and your KPIs. Because at the end of the day, digital is so overwhelming as it is. Yeah. I mean, in the space of a couple of months, we had, went from Twitter to X, we had threads, you know, we had all of these new people coming along and taking over things and everything. So why wouldn't you be strategic with it? Why wouldn't you narrow it down? Because it gives you a focus in a really, really overwhelming space as it is. And that's what strategy does. So, you know, at Teesside, that's what we teach is the, these fundamentals. But with that added layer of all these innovations that are coming on, because what we essentially want is to to create a cohort of marketers that can go out into this workplace and, and be confident and, and smash it and come up with these amazing campaigns for these brands. So it, it, is, it is important to have that grounding and that underpinning in your strategy. Absolutely, um, it, that's music to my ears. That I'm so glad that we, mm. we, we still haven't, haven't lost that because it's so important. But I do think that the expectations for uh, marketers now, I think that there's expectations that they can actually do everything. So I, I see this hybrid marketer now where you know you can think strategically you can put your plan together but you can actually execute the plan by creating the content so you've got to have you've got to be a videography you've got to be a good photographer you've got to be a great copywriter now so i think i think the the world of marketing in that sense is changing you can't just rely on well the creative department will do that you can if you're in a large organization but if you're working in a in an sme or a, a smaller organization and you're the marketer you're everything and, it, and that's a huge 
task to undertake. You know, it's a huge expectation for anyone to place on themselves when they set up as an independent digital marketer, which I think is one of the real values of studying digital marketing, not just because it gives you some of those skills or those skills that you need. It also builds you the networks. It helps you to build the networks of other people who can support you in that. So you set up, you might study digital marketing, you set up as an independent, but then you go, right, I need two cameras for this. So I'm going to bring in two videographers for it. I know those people because I met them at uni, you know, and you, you start to build those networks and you meet employers too who will also have teams who may be able to come and get involved with you, people that you might end up working for as well. So I think one of the good things about studying digital marketing at university is the fact that you, you do develop those core skills. But for the jobs that you get that are possibly a bit more than you can handle, you also know the people who can support that. Power of you also know yeah. what you need, you know, so you don't, if you, you can't do everything yourself, but you do know that you're going to need to bring in an SEO expert for that, then you know what you're looking for. If you haven't studied it, you don't yeah. necessarily know what no, you're looking for. Complex, yeah, it, it really is. And I also think as well, like if you, on the flip side, if you do go into a business and you are the only marketer there, it is really... Um, it's really difficult not to be to lose your head with it and it does happen they'll come in and they'll expect the world from you i've seen job descriptions where i've been like that's five jobs that's mm. insane and it's like a marketing assistant mm -hmm. but what i want to say is it's meant to be fun and it's meant to be exciting we work and, and i'm so privileged to work in this discipline because i love the fact that i'm not and i would say i wasn't an expert in it um because you know i'm never going to be i'm never going to be at the forefront of it is of it but isn't that exciting that the students are going to come in that I teach and they're going to go what do you mean you haven't heard about this and have you seen this new app and have you seen uh, what this brand is doing and I, I might be like absolutely not but tell me more yeah. and that's what it should be we should always be inquisitive so when you come to university you you will get the, the skills for digital market but you're also going to get that softer skills of resilience and time management and all of these things that you do need to go into a business or an SME be completely having to do all of this stuff but knowing that you can do it because you've had that great grounding in the discipline and that you might go, oh, hang on a minute, I remember this thing that Jane taught me in the seminar and she said this, and then you apply it and then it becomes so much more richer because you've taken that academic theory and you've put it into professional practice, which is what really it's all about. It's amazing. And as you say as well, you know, it's in a, in a, a good teaching, teacher-student relationship is that you learn from each other. Mm. And particularly in, I mean, my son, he's 14, and he can, he's just amazing with the tech and the apps that they do and all the things. He, he made me a, a reel the other day of my Sunday roast post, <laughs> which I was quite proud of. <laughs> I selected the music, he just did the reel. But it was, it was pretty, but he did it like, he was concentrating on something else and just doing that and it was done. So it was just, it's that digital literacy that this new generation coming up have because he was born in the era of smartphone and iPad. And he was doing that before he could talk. So it's, yeah. you know, and that itself brings challenges, I guess. Jane, you said you had another hot topic trend yes, in digital I did. marketing. Well, it, it's <clears throat> not a new trend, but it is, it's just getting bigger. So influencer marketing in digital has, is just huge now. Everything from whatever level of influencer, from, you know, like the absolute, you know, like the, the nano level of the teeny tiny influencer people with, you know, only a few thousand followers, but who are very specialist and very niche, up to the, you know, the Kardashian type influencers sure. and all levels in between that. Pretty much every product now is looking, or every service is looking for a way to get some kind of influencer involved in it. Um, so, so yeah, I, I think influencer marketing, it, it's been the biggest growth area in digital mm -hmm. over the past two or three years. And I it, it's kind of become embedded in digital marketing now and I don't see that changing. So Emily mentioned earlier about word of mouth and mm -hmm. things being sold by word of mouth and influencers are kind of, to some degree, the new word of mouth. We use influencers as people who are kind of relatable to us. So if Emily's an influencer, um, I might not know Emily, 
but I know that she knows about, you know, those nice checky shirts and she's really cool on checky shirts and Emily's super fashionable. So Emily's super fashionable and she says, this is a great checky shirt that I got from this shop. I, I might get one of those, you know, I just need to click that link and get one of those on store. So it's, we're looking for people who are kind of relatable, who do that kind of authentic content and digital marketing has kind of, in their strategies now, the did, um, influencers are kind of embedded right in the middle of that. And one of the things that audiences find that is that anybody can be an influencer. And yeah. so I think it's a really it's a really interesting part of digital marketing. I would agree. And again, it's born out of that's consumer behaviour theory, isn't it? You know, sort of, you know, different sort of reference power and, you know, and, and in sort of like the, the 90s and the noughties, the literature and all that space, it was all about celebrity yeah. endorsement then, wasn't it? So it was a yeah. celebrity, you know, but you're right now, it's anyone who can do it. And yeah. there's people, there's, there's, there's like families just vlogging and blogging and yeah. reviewing things. Yeah. And hey guys, look, we're just going into uh, get an apple pie today. And you find yourself watching it though. You know what I mean? It's quite compelling, but influencer marketing is a big area. Rob Kozinets has just written a new book on that, actually. I've just got it. I need to read it oh, really? uh, on the whole influencer marketing thing. Yeah, yeah. And you know, you have child influencers now. Yeah. You know, you've got little kids who want to watch these kids yeah. on YouTube and so on. You know, so you've got kids who are being influenced. You have people who are influencing all kinds of things, you know, around not just around what we wear and the cars that we drive and so on, um, but you know, what we eat yeah. and food marketing and food marketing to children and so on. So I work on several projects that relate to obesity and they're around obesity and food management and weight management decisions. And they're around mm -hmm. um, all the complex systems that feed in to people's eating habits and I'm involved in those you know so social and cultural and political and economic factors and so on. They all feed into issues with weight and weight management but then I'm involved in these projects from a digital perspective it's like what are people seeing online what are they following who are they listening to around what they should eat you know and that so there's the influencers who are promoting certain things there's the online advertising of yeah. the various different products and how how do people know if they're healthy or not and so on. so digital in that space and influencers in that sense are involved in loads of aspects of our lives so i think sometimes when we when we talk about digital marketing it it sounds as if what we're talking about is i've got this phone and i want to sell it to you but digital marketing covers so many other facets of our lives too lifestyle and, generally, yes, isn't it? yeah 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 really yeah health as yes. you say is, is is a big one on there i mean i'm going back to sort of when my second child was born in 2011 and it start, she started looking at YouTube then from a very young age just watching somebody with painted thumbs opening up kinder eggs. Yeah, <laughs> it's know? a massive thing. I mean my nephew, he's really into Fortnite and if I go around his house he'll say, Auntie Emily watch me play Fortnite and then what on the YouTube on the screen will watch somebody else also playing Fortnite. So I'm watching three people playing Fortnite mm -hmm. here yeah. and I can't look away from it because he knows if I look away. But he is just so, in it. all they're doing is playing games but that was that happened years ago when I was, um, in, well, I suppose into, into, into influencer marketing is the wrong thing to say, but when I used to watch YouTube, when it started, it was all um, PewDiePie and KSI and all of these like old school people that you'd just be watching them playing a game. Mm -hmm. But that was, they, they would be, you know, you would be along with the journey with them. I think influencer marketing is really interesting and actually um, I've met a couple of influencers that I've watched. I was... <laughs> I was at Download Festival once um, and it was raining and um, this band was on and I just wasn't, I wasn't into the band. So, I, you know, you can imagine the scene. I've got my hood up and I'm like, oh God. And I see this last burst into tears next to me and I think, oh my God, is she okay? Like, is she, is she hurt? Um, no, it was because an influencer had walked past her and she grabbed her and she was like, you've changed my life. You know, if it wasn't for your videos, I wouldn't be here. And the influencer was a bit like, oh God, you know, but it, it's that power of trust and that parasocial relationship that they've built together. Um, and because they film in their houses, their homes, um, their, their family members, their pets, that it becomes something that you see there, as, as Goffman would say, you see their backstage, you don't see the front stage, that celebrity persona. You see where they live, 
where they inhabit and their lifestyles and that's what creates that real element of trust so when they start their own clothing range which usually does happen brand collaboration um you feel inclined to buy it um but that real emotive feeling was was I was quite taken back by it, um, as, as a, you know, as a person that's just a so aware of influencer marketing. Now, it's mm. actually it was it was really interesting. That's really interesting isn't it, that these influencers become by default celebrities. Mm. You'd have exactly. had that sort of reaction if I don't know back in the day, if, I don't know, David Beckham had oh, yeah. walked yeah. past you or something like that. Yeah. But now it seems to be less celebrity, more authentic. Just. I'm just Noel living in Middlesbrough and I'm going to do some videos periodically. And Exactly. And there's also because influencers are there much more, they're integrated much more into your life. So, you know, you might say, for example, David Beckham was your example. You might watch David Beckham on TV. You might watch him on a programme. You might watch him. I'm sure my age there, aren't I, really, yeah, by the, the way, past, David Beckham. Way I'm sure that's... Way <laughs> way <in the> past <laughs> playing football, yeah. you know, you might be watching him, you know, you might see him like that on the screen. But, you know... To some degree, you can interact with him online now, but but you know, for influencers, particularly the ones who kind of grow relatively organically, they are they appear to be having conversations with the people who are watching them. They appear, you know, they they may or may not be, they but they're out, interacting. Yeah, 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 they're interacting in some way, and they're responding to their audience. You know, so if their audience love a particular thing, then influencers are going to talk more about it you know if they love a particular product they're gonna sell more of it you know so they're they're, they're the audience feel that trust that emily mentioned and that relatability and that authenticity because they're in yeah. their house um so masks to a significant degree the fact that this content is very very curated mm. you know they're they're putting their best clothes on to sit in a house or they're putting their worst clothes on if that's the if that's the persona they want to happen to portray at that particular time but audiences really feel involved with them they feel much close to them so i, I don't know if, i don't know if you used that word there emily that, that it's like this what's known as the parasocial relationship you know so the parasocial relationship is like you you feel like you have a relationship with this person you don't know that person no. at all i was interested where you said this you know the influencer was kind of a bit taken aback yeah, to to be approached in that way because that's a huge responsibility to change someone's life. It is. Yeah. And I think, you know, well, uh, ages ago, and I'm, sure, I'm sure my age now, where I remember just a Bieber and Lady Gaga said, I don't want to meet fans anymore because I cannot deal with that emotional responsibility of a meet and greet when they come and they start yeah. crying and telling me how much I've changed their lives. Yeah. So for this lass who's just at Download Festival with her friends, yeah. You know, you must be on high alert all, all yeah. the time, wondering who you're going to see yes. and who you've impacted upon. Yeah. But um, in, in terms of like influence marketing as well, it doesn't need to just be humans. Um, it's also pets, Doug the Pug. I don't know, shout out if anybody remembers <laughs> Doug the Pug. You know, and um, you know, there's a, that drummer called Nandy Bushel. She um, drums with a lot of rock bands. She's filmed and she's put out there and, you know, she would technically be classed as an influencer. But it's amazing now how much of an integral part of a marketing strategy it's become. And it's it's really, really interesting because it, it's essentially you getting into a brand new audience. A perfect example was Gucci. I remember um, I was watching these in fashion influencers because that's who I usually tend to watch quite a lot of, or music. Um, and there was these Gucci loafers and I was like, they're horrible. First thing, I, saw, I just didn't like them. Um, but I've seen them that many times now that I've actually Googled them um, and they're 500 pounds. And, you know, I was a bit like, Are maybe, maybe <laughs> oh my God, no, I could, unless somebody wanted to drop it off under the Christmas tree at Christmas, <laughs> hint, hint, uh, to my family. But no, I, it was, I'd seen it that much and they work with so many different influences in my space that I ended up then going onto the website, clicking on, reading the description and they've, and they've hooked you and they've got you where they want you, which is on their landing page, on their domain. And then when you're there, that's when they start that customer journey with you. You know, the loyalty, the have you not bought before, have you had 10% off ease an affiliate link. Um, another perfect example is the train guy on TikTok. Um, he started with train spotting, didn't he? Um, and just basically it was an interest that he just put it out on TikTok, he went viral. And then Gucci said, be the, fr be the face of our campaign. Incredible, isn't it? Yeah, uh, two tangible people that your industries that you wouldn't have thought of linked, but made perfect sense. And you know, that's who they ended up working with. It's amazing. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm quite into aviation and there's a lot of sort of pilots and cabin crew that you can, that, on Instagram that have become <laughs> absolute stars. You, you, so yeah. you, you can't go in the cockpit anymore now, obviously, the flight deck mm -hmm. because of all the restrictions, but 
more than ever now, you can be in there through the lens of of, of video, do you know what I mean? And th them actually posting my landing in, I don't know, the, the Maldives or something like that. It's like really, there's some superstars that have, that have become really famous yeah. in that sort of space. Concord Julie's one, shout out to Concord Julie, a mentor pilot and Captain Chris, who became an, in this Captain Chris is interesting. He became an Instagram star um, at the start of the pandemic. Um, his son said, you need to do something with this. And they just came up with um, a slogan. Buy air, airline, t buy air tickets, um, like you bought toilet paper. And he started posting and it became viral. His posts are brilliant and he's huge in the aviation world. Now he's doing great things for aviation, but his posts are amazing. But isn't that just it? Simplicity, Simplicity. at the heart of everything that you do. And also what's great about influencer marketing is they, they work with their audience and not against them. Mm. They're flexible. And that's when, it, when mm. we talk about marketing, that's one of the biggest things. You, you mentioned future forecasting. We need to work with our audience and let them shape that content. Because I remember when I did journalism, user generated content was a big thing. How do we use it? How do we utilize it? Mm. It's essentially influencer marketing. and there's really clever and innovative ways to do it and use it. Barbie Premier was one of them. Um, there were there were all the influencers were on the red, well, the pink carpet, and um, helped get that movie, which already had, was it 140, 145 million dollars it cost to make. 150 million dollars went into that marketing budget, something like that, and they used it through influencer marketing and collaboration. As it was a really core part of that strategy. I haven't seen it, but my daughter and my wife have seen it twice. But I love the sound. We listen to the soundtrack in the car. I love the Barbie soundtrack. It's absolutely fantastic. You need to treat yourself to it. It's great. It's a totally meta level, yeah. feminist crisis of masculinity kind of movie. It's great. It's yeah. a really good movie. My wife said that. So it's the end bit. He is basically. No spoilers. No spoilers. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You have to edit that out. We have to edit that out. <laughs> Forgot about that. Yeah. <laughs> I'd be a terrible radio host. <laughs> I'd have been fired off the BBC. And they want to be bleeping you out, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah. So on that point, that's obviously influences. That's the that's the big sort of uh, trend at the moment, I guess. But do you think it's made making the job of a marketer more complex now? The fact that the consumers are driving the content. They they've actually they've actually I think to a certain extent you might disagree taken the baton from the marketing manager or the marketing director now because they're out there sort of creating messages and ideas and perceptions and and pushing them out do you think that's 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 a challenge for us as the profession up to a point but but i think it's one of those things that if you run with it so things change really quickly so say for example i was each year at the start of an academic year um, I will get students to work together, you know, so they start to get to know each other, get them to work together to do a kind of introductory thing of whatever they wanted to do. And up until last year, they always used to make a little video, post the video online, do that. Um, last year, everyone made TikToks. So nobody made a video, they all made TikToks, you know, so it's just like, right, we're, we're, we're doing TikToks because that's what we're going to do. So, so, so that has been adopted by that audience really quickly you know in the space of a year that's that's what they do that's that's their preferred medium now they're not making instagram stories as much as they used to and so on so they're 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 in in and on tiktok and so the things that people do on tiktok you know when you get the the viral stuff happening on tiktok and everyone doing the same thing then marketers can pick up on that and, and run with it rather than marketers always expecting to be in the lead and people follow. Yeah. So I think it, it's kind of, I think it's actually symbiotic. And in some ways, when marketers take that attitude, it's much easier for them than when they used to try to control um, consumer content by going, oh, why don't we do some... Um, uh, consumer generated content and um, you know you can get um, why don't you post your pictures of your coffee when you come into our store or why don't you post your pictures of you know you wearing our product and things that could just be totally random and totally terrible that they had no real control over so you get all this terrible content that was then associated with the brand whereas now you can have people doing stuff on TikTok that marks go oh that's cool we can kind of get involved in that up to a point but we don't have to let the audience create 
our brand too much for us or create the you know influence yeah. what our brand looks like that's perfect that yeah I, I totally agree with jane and the use of the symbiotic is great and control because there is an element of control if you bring an influencer um, marketing um into your strategy you will give them a brief it's a bit like pr and journalism you, you need each other um, so when an influencer comes into work with you, you might say, I want to commission you for this piece of content. We're going to work on this campaign together and this is how that, this is how it's going to go. You might just send them a product. But at the end of the day, if they didn't like your product, I've seen loads of brands flip that on its head and, sure. and do it in a, a completely different way. I remember Weetabix, random example, they did that whole campaign, didn't they, about obscure ways that people would eat Weetabix. Um, somebody put beans on it. Mm. And that, um, was, that was massive, wasn't it? It was that massive. Was yeah. And it was because somebody had said, you know, I, I, I think it was something like, I didn't like your product and this, that and the other, and it'd be awful. And, you know, they just went, right, OK, we're just going to flip it on its head and do a whole example, or, or like a whole campaign around it. Liquid Death, who are, this, if they sound like an energy drink, they're not, they're canned water. Um, yeah. And when I was at a festival, I got one because I thought it was an energy drink and I needed it to pet me up. And then I was like, oh, it's, it's water, OK. But the whole branding is for rock audiences. It's got this flaming skull on it. And uh, what they did for their content marketing is they took all the hate comments that they get, were getting, you know, why is this? It looks like a skull. I don't like this, don't like that. And they said she turned it into a campaign. Really, really clever way of just changing it obviously it's it depends on who you work for and their level of com uh, how comfortable they are with that but um i don't think it's anything that you don't have control over even if it goes the wrong way it goes the way you're not predicting as a marketer just you, we just dig on our feet don't we and mm -hmm. we flip it to what we want our message to be which is an interesting and point yeah sorry i was going to say that just brings us kind of full circle to that point about how you use your data because even that type of you know you're getting loads of negative comments loads of negative comments is loads of people coming to your feeds is coming to your website is coming to your socials and so on so you go well you know they don't like what we have but we're getting tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of hits or whatever here. So then you go, right, what are we going to do with that? We've got all those people who are engaging with our product or our service or whatever it is in some way. So what are we going to do with that? We may be going to flip it on its head. We're maybe going to issue an apology. Whatever it is that you're going to do, you, you've brought those people to you, you know, or the social media has brought those people to you. Absolutely. I've just um, published a paper, actually, and it's because I'm I write a lot about the jazz metaphor so um and I've talked about this entrepreneurial consumer movement so these influencers effectively and my argument is that more than ever now marketers need to be jazz musicians they need to be able to improvise so we've introduced the term professor Ian Phyllis and I um improvisational marketing is the way forward where you do say right okay this is coming so it's not in our strategic marketing plan so we need to flip but we need to work quickly so we need to be more adaptable, agile and improvisatory in our mindset as marketers. Exactly. But also, can it fit in with your strategic marketing plan? Can it fit in with your objective that you're wanting it to, to be? But also, it tells you stuff. Um, your audience, if they're, if they're complaining about you, is there a current theme? Is there something that they're saying that you're thinking, we're not making this clear enough, um, this is, that this is our brand or this is our value? let's take stock and let's put some content or some really innovative um, pieces of material out there that people can interact with. Because obviously, as well as digital, you've got the traditional side of things. So is there stuff that we can do? Like I've seen a lot of people do road shows and, and, and CEOs going out and on tours around places and, and, and integrating with the audience. I think digital's a great space in that element because it's giving it's basically giving you access to an audience and your audience, but also it's giving you that access to that material out there and there's so much that you can do with it. Um, and I think you may as well just make full use of what you've got at your fingertips. And I think using your jazz metaphor there, it's even within jazz, I don't know much about jazz, I'll be honest, but even within jazz, I'm sure that when you're doing improvisation, you're doing that within a structure yeah. in that you know you know what general type of Yep. tune you're playing for example you all know how to play your instruments you're all 
specialist and expert in we help yeah. Yeah, you know yeah. you all know how Absolutely. to play your instruments you're all specialist and expert in that so even when you're improvising you're impro improvising within a structure that you yeah. that you've already predefined to some degree and i think the same works with marketing that it's like you're going to improvise and you're going to re be responsive to things um but you can't be responsive to everything you still have that core foundation yourself that you're working with and it's which bits are we going to take here? Which bits are we going to change? Which bits are we going to stick with? Which bits of our plan continue as they are? And which bits change? You know, and so in the past, you might have had marketers who were setting out, you know, like a relatively long term campaign. So say maybe a six week campaign or something. You may still be doing that, but you're responding to your data every day yeah. you know if you're able if you're in a position to do that from a staffing point of view you're responding to your data and your audience every day to work out okay the plan is still going forward we know what we're trying to do what the various stages are but you need to be keeping a check on it every day if you suddenly have something that everyone is really interested in or that everyone's really complaining about you don't just go oh well let's wait till week three and yeah. Uh, you know, and just do what we were planning to do anyway, you're going to respond to that at the time. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. No, what a fascinating discussion. So the final question I'm going to ask you both, just for quite a sort of brief response, you don't know this one. <laughs> yeah, you don't know this one. I'm going to put you on the spot here. We talked about future gazing, don't we? So Jane, what's the next five years look like for digital marketing? Okay, for me, as I mentioned earlier, so I have studied digital for a long time. And one of the things that I've recognized in studying digital that it is in all disciplines it is in all fields it's in all areas of industry it's okay. in you know it's in the creative industries it's in the manufacturing industries it's in academia it's in food production it's in everything yeah. it's in everything and one of the difficulties of studying digital because everything changes so quickly is that it it's very hard to see where it all fits together. So you've got digital over here, you've got digital over there, but your digital, your understanding of digital might not be the same as mine because we're using it differently in different places. So for me, the I think the exciting next thing, and as you know, we don't we don't know whether it will come off in the way that it's currently being envisioned, but the metaverse, the space where we are all digital and we are all interacting with digital, a space where we can test things without testing them on real life people, you know, so we can test marketing in those spaces, we can test products in those spaces, we can do scientific experiments in those spaces, we can do all digital stuff within that metaverse, metaverse space, because if we move into the metaverse, not, not actually, but if we use the concept of the metaverse for our studies and our, you know, some of our product development, our learning about new types of marketing and so on. If we use that space, digital is all the same within it and everybody from the manufacturers to the food producers to the marketers, everybody is seeing digital in the same way. So for me, I, the, the, the metaverse is a really interesting space to look forward to. In, in both senses of the word, like ahead of us, but also, well, you, you understand that. I love it. I, I, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. Thanks, Jade. So, Emily, what's, what's the next five years for you? Well, I just got completely sucked into that. So <laughs> We're all going in the metaverse. Um, I sat and thought long and hard about this when, when you told me that you, this is what, one of the questions. I think... I've read a lot of articles because we're sort of shifting into our audience will be shifting into Gen, Gen Z and their sort of consumption of it. And a lot of the studies that have been done by um, CIM, Chartered Institute of Marketing, is that uh, as brands, we need to start looking at things that is more purpose driven, more realistic, more authentic. So I think there's going to be, a, I know that it's very personalised at the moment, but an even greater need for personalisation. We're in an attention economy. It's so overwhelming with digital, your attention's here and it's there. Mm -hmm. I think there's going to be a greater need for brands to work, like I said earlier, work with their audiences, really drill down into who they are and then produce things that allow you to see that sort of backstage, that personality of your brand even further. Because we're so digitally aware now, we know how you use our data, we know all about GDPR and privacy and everything, so there's going to be need for marketers to be a little bit more savvy with how they market themselves and the strategies and the platforms that they use. And as we're getting new platforms emerge, 
Um, probably one of the biggest things that people have said to me is, oh, well, Threads has come out, so we want to be on Threads. And okay, get me on Threads. And it's like, well, is that right for your brand? And is that right for you? You might be a B2B organisation that you know, could be right for some, but is it right for your brand? And I think there's going to be a greater call on the platforms that we use, potentially X. I see a lot of people boycotting it at the yeah, moment. Um, so, uh, so I think there's going to be a greater strategic need for that personalisation element for your audience. And I look forward to seeing it as well. Well, we'll revisit it in five years. So yeah, we could probably do this in three months and it'd be different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> could possibly next week, yeah. 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 But isn't that amazing though as well as like, we don't even know how people's behaviours will change. So back in the day when I was 15, 16, I could sit down and watch a YouTube video that was five minutes long. I can't mm. even watch something that's 50 seconds long now without sure. getting bored. Yeah. So it's like how, as well as all of the future of marketing, but how are our users' behaviours going to change? We have absolutely no idea what they want and what they're looking for. And that is what makes this this space so amazing to be in because you're always going to be challenged you're always going to be receptive and flexible and agile and all these skills that we practice as marketers and it's just a really cool place to to thrive in and to learn about and to be an academic in and on that note i will draw us to a close what a fascinating conversation thank you jane thank you emily for your insights there absolutely amazing and i think you know my final summary there's never been a more exciting time to study marketing, really, because it is such uh, an evolving discipline. It's always evolved, but with that digital um, element to it, which is evolving by the second, really, um, it's never been a better time to study. It's an exciting discipline. So if you're interested, um, visit the website, www.tees.ac.uk and search for our MSc Digital Marketing uh, course and also our BSc Honours Marketing course as well, um, where there's a lot of digital in there too. Thanks very much again, Jane and Emily, and thanks to the listeners. Take care now. Bye-bye.